The landscape of this country has changed dramatically over the past 50 years or so. Today's students are indoctrinated into the world of humanism and atheism from the very first grade. We'll discover the consequences and cost of removing God from our culture. History has confirmed that teaching the godless theory of evolution while simultaneously removing prayer and Bible reading from the classroom has resulted in massive increases in immorality. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Atheism Attacks, Part 1, with Dr. Brad Harrop. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Brad Harab, holds a degree in biology and a doctorate degree in anatomy and neurobiology from the College of Medicine at the University of Tennessee. Currently, he serves as the executive director of Focus Press and co-editor of Think Magazine. Dr. Harab travels the world speaking on Christian evidences, fortifying the family, and cultural apologetics. Welcome to the program, Brad. Hey, it's great to be here, Ray. This title is really intriguing, Atheism Attacks. Absolutely. If you stop and think about it, the landscape of America has changed pretty dramatically in the last 30, 40 years where we would once see billboards that are advertising things like family businesses. Today, we see billboards actively promoting atheism, um, basically trying to, to teach the idea that all religions are fairy tales. We see buses rolling by saying, there's probably no God, stop worrying and enjoy your life. And so atheism has taken front and center in our culture today. It's not been an overnight issue. Uh, this isn't something where they woke up, they flicked a switch, and all of a sudden the atheists of the world said, hey, we need to get our, our message out there. This really started over 50 years ago. You may not remember Time Magazine many, many years ago asked the question, is God dead? Fast forward to year 2009, Newsweek had a cover issue on the decline and fall of Christian America. Wow. Uh, almost in a, a celebratory fashion. Yeah, and then the shape of a cross. You exactly, know, little... exactly. Just a, a couple of short years ago, very well-known atheist Richard Dawkins, he made the bold claim, he said, God is dead and it was science that killed him. Wow. Of course, he's not the only person that's made that bold claim. You have to go back to the 1800s. A guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche also made that bold claim that God is dead. And yet, if I were to give you an update today, we know Frederick Nietzsche is dead. Yes. God is not. Mm. The problem is atheism has infected not just our culture, but also the classroom. It has affected what our kids are learning, the worldview. In fact, I want to share with you a quote from the two th or March 2006 issue of Discover Magazine where authors are poking fun at the idea of an intelligent designer. In this magazine, take a look at what they say. Now, there's news for intelligent designers and the rest of us to ponder. We humans and all life on earth may have well evolved from the most unintelligent entities one can imagine, genetic shards that do nothing but copy themselves. They say, we are nobody's great idea. We are the fortunate mistakes of countless biochemical morons. They say that's evolution. It's humbling, 
but somehow comforting. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, I don't find that very comforting. No, I find it ridiculous. Even the, the contradiction that is unintelligent design. The word design it's, in, includes intelligence. Absolutely, absolutely. If you stop and really think logically for just a moment, what you realize, there's only two options. Either we are here because there's a God, He designed us, there is purpose in our lives, or you and I are just the product of, of random atoms colliding together billions of years, basically the, the fortunate mistake of countless biochemical morons. Now, Ray, as you look at those two very opposing worldviews, let me ask you, which one are we most frequently teaching in the textbooks today? Well, there's no question. And, and um, you know, the fact that you have a child there, um, that child, if the, if the first one is true, is nothing. It's just a random collection of, you know, a, a fortunate mistake. Absolutely. And so what you do to that child doesn't matter or anyone else. Absolutely. Um, over and over again, what the textbooks are teaching is this concept that we evolved. For instance, this is a, a textbook put out by Harcourt Brace. It says humans probably evolved from bacteria that lived more than 4 billion years ago. 4 billion years we evolved from bacteria. Or this is a Prentice Hall textbook used extensively in the United States. They say we know, for example, that humans evolved from common ancestors we share with other living primates such as chimpanzees and apes. I mean, over and over again, trying to convey this attitude of, oh yeah, we know, you know, evolution, it's a fact. We evolved from apes. But I want you to notice in this next example, the danger of this particular worldview and what they're subtly saying to our kids. This is a, another biology textbook. It says, by the seventh month, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby. But then notice what they say, but it is not. <laughs> My question would be, why are we teaching our young people that a seven-month-old in the womb is not a human child? Because at this stage, seven months is viable in most places. Oh, yes. I even know parents who, you know, their child was born premature seven months or a little earlier. Absolutely. Six months. Take a look at what I call the evil of marketing, the picture that's associated with that statement. Yeah, that's not seven months. That is a, <laughs> uh, any woman that has given birth will tell you by seven months they're doing aerobics in the yeah, womb. Yes. And yet, if they can get our children to associate that kind of picture yeah. with that statement, it makes it a whole lot easier mm. to abort. Now, what I hear as I travel, a lot of parents say, well, you know, Dr. Brad, that, that's science. That doesn't really affect me, doesn't affect our community. Mm. And they would go on to say, certainly that doesn't affect my child's religious beliefs. And so I, I have to point out, actually, at this stage, it's even worse. And what I mean by that, this is a, a copy of a textbook, very modern. You'll notice this is a chapter on genetics, genetics and evolution. The very first sentence in this chapter, Ray, it's teaching that concept that we all evolve from a common ancestor, something that I basically have come to expect in textbooks today. But what you may not expect is what you find on the following pages. You know, as you turn the page, for instance, the top of the next page says, the mythology of most peoples includes a story explaining the appearance of humans on earth. The account of creation recorded in Genesis in the Bible, for example, explains human origins. The Bible is mythology. According to them, wow. they would say it's mythology. In fact, in that same textbook, they have a picture of the Tower of Babel. But I want you to notice what the caption says. Now, again, remember, this is science textbook. We're talking about genetics, evolution, and yet here's what the textbook reads. The unfinished Tower of Babel, described in the first book of the Bible, symbolizes an ancient West Asian myth. Myth about mm. the origins of language diversity. So Ray, I, I'm gonna go up to the board. I want us to look at the scientific data of what atheism is actually doing to our culture. Before we jump into the data itself, I, I do want to point out, this is a, a quote from Benjamin Rush. He's one of the, the 
Founding Fathers, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and I want you to notice specifically what he has to say about keeping religion and education together. He says, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. He says, without this, there can be no virtue. Without virtue, there can be no liberty. Liberty is the object and the life of all republican governments. But notice what he goes on to say. Without religion, I believe learning does much mischief to the morals and the principles of mankind. If you don't have a true north on your moral compass, you're going to be in trouble. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn a little something from history. I'm, I'm one of those guys that believes firmly if you don't learn from it, you're probably going to repeat it. Mm. Now, I, I could start my history lesson way, way back. We could go all the way back, for instance, to 1859 when a guy by the name of, of Charles Darwin he penned a little book you may have heard a little something about called The Origin of Species, but realistically, that's too far back. You know, I don't think anybody was around in 1859 that is living today. Mm -hmm. uh, we could even go back to 1925 to when the Scopes Monkey Trial took place, Dayton, Tennessee. But again, if you stop and think, of, that's roughly 100 years ago. Not too many folks around at that time. What I would rather do, I, I want to start during a time in which people living today can actually associate with. So we're going to go back to the 1950s. Now, I, I realize that's before our time. <laughs> 1950s is when the government kind of got involved in science. They formed the National Science Foundation. In fact, those of you who were living back in the 50s, you may remember we were racing the Russians to space. Well, in 1957, we got beat. The Russians launched a satellite called Sputnik, and suddenly there was lots of fear, panic about what does that mean? Are they going to put lasers on it? And so there was lots of pressure to produce better scientists. The very next year, or two years later, in 1959, Eisenhower's advisors came to him. And they said, hey, what we need to do is scrap the way we're teaching science. We, we need to go with, instead of God and creation, we need to use what these other nations are using. We need to go with evolution. They based their recommendation on three countries, China, Germany, and Russia. Not, not exactly the countries we need to be following in that area, but basically what Eisenhower did in 1959... He asked Congress for a billion dollars to revamp the way we were teaching human origins. Now, Ray, a billion dollars today, that's a lot of money. But a billion dollars in 1959? Wow. That was an enormous amount of money, and he got it. And I want you to watch the dominoes start falling right after that. So, 1959, he asked for the money. By the way, that was also the 100th anniversary of Darwin's book. Probably not a, uh, a, a coincidence there. A couple of years later, 1962, the Supreme Court said, no more prayer in school. We, we don't want your, your religion. In fact, the very next year, some of you may remember the name Madeline Murray O'Hare. She was able to kick Bible reading out of the classroom. And so it, here we've got Bible and, and God being kicked out at the same time we're injecting a godless theory. In fact, by 1968, the state of Arkansas was told, you must teach human evolution. You don't have an option. The very next year, 1969, the Supreme Court passed the no-fault divorce law, basically opening the floodgates to divorce for any reason. If, if somebody burns the biscuits, for instance, you, you could actually get a divorce. Prior to this, believe it or not, it was actually difficult for people to get a divorce. It, it had to be one of the, the three A's, either abuse, abandonment, or adultery. Well, that's very biblical when you think of it, isn't it? It is. This basically was one of the pillars of the home that started to crumble. And the reason I throw this in there is because ultimately, if the home is not firm in its foundation, 
the culture is going to follow right after it. Now, I know a lot of people would ask the question, what does this matter? You know, who, who cares? Ultimately, ultimately, it matters because what our children believe about their origins actually dictates behavior. Now, I'm going to prove that to you scientifically, but I want you to understand what they think about where they came from really matters. Adolf Hitler once made the comment, he said, let me control the textbooks and I will control the state, which given the state of our, our textbooks today, that ought to kind of send a, a chill right up your spine to think, yeah, we're teaching some of this craziness today. What have been the results of this first history lesson? Well, I'm going to use the year 1963 as kind of our landmark year because you remember Eisenhower, he asked for the money in 1959. Normally takes about four years from the time you, you make that financial request mm. to actually get it into the textbooks. And by 1963, we had outlawed prayer and Bible reading. Now, did we get evolution into the textbooks? Oh, absolutely. In a huge way. You see this, this massive spike right here. We went from teaching it just as a, a theory, hey, this is something that, that's out there, to it being quite literally a central core tenant of everything. You know, that chart is really important because I think a lot of us don't realize that it took that long for evolution to really get into the textbooks in a, in a major way. And, you know, that's over 100 years of, okay, Darwin has published his book and you know, a lot of scholars and, and, and scientists are arguing about it, but we weren't teaching it to the kids. Absolutely. The interesting part of this is, so obviously we got lots and lots of evolution in the textbooks, but then we started getting other fruits that we weren't expecting. So, for instance, let me show you a couple of these very quickly. The percentage of teenage girls having premarital sex. So you'll notice this blue line right here in the center. That represents the year 1963. You'll see that in several of these graphs. Prior to that, over here, we were still teaching there's a God, you were created by God. After that, you're just the fortunate mistake of countless biochemical morons. Yeah, as a side section to this one, sexually transmitted diseases. Notice this, in children ages 10 to 14 has gone up 385% since 1963. Wow, that's unbelievable. 10 to 14. Premarital or birth rates for unwed girls, ages 15 to 19, up 200%. Again, you see kind of these steady lines, and then it just starts dramatically shooting up. Interestingly, pregnancy itself, you've got birth rates at, at roughly 200%, but the pregnancies were actually up about 500%. And you say, why, why don't... Why didn't the pregnancy rate and the birth rate equal? Well, that's because in 1973, we legalized abortion. And so now a pregnancy did not necessarily mean a birth. You've got out of wedlock births as a percentage of all births. Again, up. If I were to update my graph today, roughly 43% of all children born in this country, they come home to just one parent the reason why that's important is because God had a plan for the family. But also, if you take a father out of the home, I mean, just look at some of these real statistics. 71% of high school dropouts come from homes without a father. 85% of the young people in prison right now, as I'm talking to you, they came from homes without a dad. Or how about this one? Unmarried couples living together, up 725% since 1963. Divorce rate, again, up since 1963. Violent crime in the United States of America has gone up dramatically since 1963, up 995% since 1963. How about this one? Suicide up 253% in young people. Again, not a surprise because if you take away God, you're taking away their hope. Or child abuse, up 2,300% since 1963. But again, not a big surprise because when you tell people, hey, you came from animals, 
guess what they act like? And last but not least, illegal drug use is up 6,000% since 1963. Brad, I have to stop you right there. We need to take a break. Join us right after these messages. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Back to Origins, we're talking to Dr. Brad Harib, who's been sharing about atheism attacks. Brad, I have to say, the statistics that you showed us before the break are, are like nothing I've ever seen before on the program. That much put together. I mean, just where our nation is going and what it's lost. I mean, what do we have to say about what, how can we change this? I mean, when you, when you stop and think about the fact that that's scientific data, it's numbers, can't, numbers don't lie. Um, the, the real report card of our country is not one that we should be bragging about. You know, since 1963, the United States has become the world leader in violent crime, divorce rate, teenage pregnancy, illegal drug, drug use, and we got the highest illiteracy rate of any industrial nation. Th those are not things that we should be bragging about, Ray. And that's when we decided to change the way we were teaching our children Absolutely, in when we changed ultimately the worldview of their origins. In fact, to, to kind of really give it to you in a way that will make it crystal clear, if I could put us on a time machine, take us back to the year 1960. So before either one of us were born, we go into a high school, walk down the hallway, open up a classroom door and we ask a teacher just one question. You know, what, what is your biggest problem? What is your biggest complaint? Take a look at the top two answers. This survey was actually given back then and you'll notice the top two answers, talking and chewing gum. I remember having to stand in the corner in seventh grade because I was caught chewing gum. There you go. <laughs> so talking and chewing gum, then here's what we do. We get back on our time machine and we come to modern day and we go into a, a high school today. Of course, first we got to realize you don't just walk into a high school today, Ray. You may have to get a visitor pass. You may have to go through metal detectors, uh, dogs, drug sniffing dogs, those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, let's say we do get in. We walk down the hallway and we ask a teacher that same question. Now again, they've been doing this survey for years and years and years. And I want you to notice some of the answers that are given more recently. Things like rape, robbery, assault, burglary. All of these massive crimes. And yet here's the take home message that I hope the viewers won't miss. If you take a 16-year-old child from today and a 16-year-old child from 1960, you know, anatomically, they're exactly the same. But something has dramatically changed. We've gone from talking and chewing gum being the biggest problem to all kinds of, of crimes, drug use. I think it's what we're putting in right up here and ultimately, it's our view 
and our attitude towards God. This is a false religion. They're, they're teaching what they believe is right and wrong, good and evil, and they're, and they're attacking Christianity, which if this is just science, why are they attacking a religion? Well, and they, they, you hear commonly this whole, oh, we've got to have separation of church and state, but they don't acknowledge the fact that humanism, atheism, they are religions, they're belief forms that have free access and free reign to our children. And nobody is talking about the fact that if you take God out of the equation, then how do you know what's right and what's wrong? You, you don't have a true north on your moral compass. Well, Brad, I really want to thank you for sharing this. I hope our viewers uh, were paying attention and I hope, uh, you know, we're getting on our knees and praying because I don't know what else really we can do in the interim. We need to pray that God would have mercy, that we would turn away from this false religion. I mean, he's making it clear we're destroying ourselves. We just have to listen to scripture and get back to God, it seems Absolutely. to me. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it very much. And thank you for joining us. You know, it's clear that for the last 60 years, more than 60 years, there has been an ongoing attack on America. The attacker is not a foreign nation. It's not a disease. It's not a natural disaster, but a false religion called atheism. The carnage from this war is unmistakable. In rejecting God, we are bringing disaster on our nation, just as scripture warns over and over. It just goes to show that we know what the Bible says is true. And this time, unfortunately, the proof really is all around us. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program number 2303, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.